open up the Word of God. We are here tonight, continuing again our study of the cross in our series entitled Cross Talking. Tonight, we're going to turn our attention to the enemy of our souls, amen, the devil. And we've been talking about what uh, the cross means to the uh, to the saved person, and we're still there, uh, but we are going to give special attention to the enemy, because one of the things that the cross does, one of the things that the cross does, the cross tells us that the devil is a defeated foe, amen, and we're going to tell you all the ways, all the ways that Satan is defeated, that scripture talks about tonight, so once again, we pray uh, that you will stay with us as we get into the word of God, we ask that if you're watching over Facebook, that you share out this page, and others also uh, may be blessed, amen. And so we are, we are primed, as the as the saying goes, we are primed, we are ready, and we just bless the Lord and thank Him once again for giving us this opportunity to open up His Word, amen. We are going to pray, and we're going to get right into it. Lord, we bless you, we honor you, we thank you once again. You've given us another opportunity to open up Your Word, and Lord. We pray that as we speak about the enemy, Lord, we know we don't speak about the enemy to try to give him any leeway, to try to give him any uh, any type of an upper hand in our life. But Lord, we speak about the enemy because we are going to speak about his defeat. The fact that we have overcome and we will overcome him, that we are victorious over him in every way. Amen. And so we pray that these words tonight uh, might get into our hearts and our spirits, that we might be able to apply them to our hearts. Uh, Lord, we pray that even tonight that we do no violence to your word. Lord, we know that you are the side of listening to all that we do and say, and we want you to have your way. Speak as you will, Lord Jesus. Bring conviction, encouragement, enlightenment. Lord, do what only your word can do. So, Lord, once again, have your way. We bring this before you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, here we are. Here we are, and we are going to, as I said, uh, we are going to speak of the enemy. And, and not just the fact that we are uh, victorious over the enemy, uh, but just what the enemy tries to do to us, uh, he, he, he still, uh, what the things that we speak about tonight, we must keep in mind that we are dealing with a very dangerous foe, a defeated foe is a dangerous foe, amen, someone who knows that he doesn't have a chance, someone who knows that he is defeated, now once again, we have to, we, we, and we can't assume to try to get into the into the mind and psyche of Satan. But though he knows that he is defeated, this does not change his mode of operation. The fact that he knows how it all ends, because he's been to the end of the book, the Bible, he knows how it will all end, this does not stop him. There is no, there is no uh, discouragement, no depression. He forges on, he moves ahead, uh, and he continues to do what he does. He is not going to stop because he's been to the end. Uh, he's been to the last page. He's not going to stop. He's going to continue. And in his hearts of hearts, he is so he is so angry. He is so bitter. He is he he, he is such that he 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 believes, even though he knows it's not going to work. He believes that he can overcome all that has been spoken against him. He believes that he can overcome all that has been spoken against him. This is because he is not only uh, he is not only a defeated foe; he is a deceived foe. He believes his own hype. He is deceived. He believes that he can overcome it all, even in spite of all the things I said that he that uh, he, he he's not going to stop. He believes that he can bypass everything that he knows is going to happen. He can get around it. Uh, and he, he's just going to do and, and try to bring as many people with him as he can. And, th and that's what he is out to do. Amen. So what does the cross mean to the saved person tonight? The cross means that the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. And there are several ways that the Bible goes about telling us several powerful scriptures that speak uh, to the truth that Satan is defeated. Let's 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 go through these scriptures so we can so we can get the comprehensiveness, the completeness of Satan's utter defeat. He is defeated. Okay? Let let's make no mistake about it. He is defeated. We go first uh we go first 
uh, to John. Let's go to, to the book of John, chapter number 12, and verse number 31. This is what Jesus says. And Jesus, we mentioned previously uh, that Jesus speaks of Satan as being the prince of this world three times. Three times in the Gospels, Satan, uh, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world or this age. Here's what he says in verse number 31 of John chapter number 12. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What does that word cast out mean? It means to be expelled. It means to be ejected. Amen. It means to be it means to be sent away. Okay? Satan Satan would not be able to accomplish and do that which he all that he completely desires to do because he at the cross, at the cross he was cast out. He was cast out. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie of, of several word of faith teachers and, and the teaching that says that when Jesus died, uh, he went to hell and he was just uh, basically tortured and stomped and beat and, and, just, uh, and just waylaid uh, for three days until God stepped in and rescued Jesus and then Jesus became the first born again man. Don't believe that lie. It sounds very good. It's very good for Hollywood. It sounds very dramatic, but unfortunately, and fortunately, that is not what took place. That is not what took place when Jesus died. Amen? And so when, when on the cross, Satan was, once again, Jesus says here uh, that Satan is cast out. Okay? Everything leading up to what would be the cross, Satan was being cast out. He was being cast out. We go a few chapters later, and we go to chapter number 16. John, once again, Jesus speaking. John chapter 16, and verse number uh, 11. Let's start in verse number 9. Let's start in verse number 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Verse number 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world, once again, he's referring to Satan, the prince or the ruler of this world is judged. So not only not only is Satan cast out, but Satan has been judged. Okay? He has been judged. It has been determined basically that he is uh guilty. Um this this word uh, judge simply means uh, it means to be sentenced. It means to be sentenced. It means to be uh, punished. It means to be condemned okay this is what happened at the cross when jesus died he was cast out and satan was supremely judged he was judged amen and so once again we cannot believe we cannot believe the lie you see uh the bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus okay why why is this why is this true? Why what is one of the reasons why this is true? Because Satan himself Satan himself is condemned. He has been judged. Okay? And and God uh God does not condemn his people. And Satan cannot condemn God's people. Okay? We'll get into that a little bit later in in the study if we get to it. 1 John chapter number 3. When we go to 1 John chapter number 3 uh, and verse number 8, we see something else that happened at the cross because of the cross when it comes to Satan. Verse, 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 8, it says, He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose... For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are destroyed. The works, the things that he does. Okay. Now, once again, we're gonna when we when we're through 
uh, with these things that the cross has done to Satan. We're going to try to bring it all together uh, because there's some things that we need to, to know even about the things that we're talking about here. But it says here that the works, for this reason was Satan made, was, was uh, the Son of God made known why he came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Now, this word destroy, and we see the word destroy several times in Scripture talking about Satan. And in this particular instance, talking about his works, it's talking about this word destroy does not carry the same meaning and the same understanding that we have of destruction. We know what we mean by when something is destroyed. We mean that it is totally obliterated. It is totally uh, excuse me. It is totally done away with. This is this is the understanding that we have when we talk about something being destroyed. Okay, but that is not quite the case uh, in the Greek language. Once again, we see this word used several different times uh, concerning Satan, and here, and here, uh, the word destroy, talking about the destruction of his works, talks about they are loosened. That's what that word destroy here means. It means it means to be loosened or to be broken up or to be dissolved, or to be put off. There remains, once again, when we talk about Satan's power, we have to be very careful. When we say that Satan has no power, understand what we mean. Satan still retains a modicum of power, and that is not any contradiction of terms. That is not a contradiction of terms. He still retains a modicum of power, yet he has no power over the child of God. He has no power over you and I as Christians. I heard this years ago, and I still believe it, that we that Satan only has the power that we give him. We, he only wields the power that we allow him to have. Once again, we keep our eyes on Jesus. But once again, we still have to understand that the sin nature is still very present in us. And though the sin nature is in a state of dormancy, it is still there. And we can do things sometimes in such a way that the sin nature will be revived. The sin nature will come back to life. The sin nature, the, 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 the plug, so to speak, has been pulled on the sin nature. But it can easily, and I use the word easily, be revived if certain things take place in our life. Okay? If we begin to look in other places uh, for our faith, uh, if we put our faith in other places, the sin nature will rise. It will rise. Okay, and and that's not our lesson tonight, but you hear us say this all the time because it's so very true. And so the 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 works of Satan have been loosened. They have been they have been dissolved. Uh, they have been broken up and put off. Uh, once again, he still retains a modicum of power. Now, we have to take that verse, take that verse, and now we go to the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 2 uh, and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14 also talks about destruction, but here's what, listen, listen to what this says. Hebrews 2 and 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same, that through death, talking about Christ's death, through death, he might, Jesus, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so here, here it says, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 8, it says that Jesus Christ was manifest, he was made known, so that he would destroy the works of the devil, loosen them, break them up, dissolve them. Here, here he says that that same death, the same manifesting of Christ and his death was for the purpose that he might destroy the destroy him that had the power of death, the devil. Destroy him. Now this word destroy has a different connotation than the previous word destroy. Here's what this word destroy means uh, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 14. It's talking about it means to render useless. Once again, you see it's not talking about obliteration. Okay? Doesn't exist anymore because it's just in a billion trillion pieces and it just has no... No. But it, it does mean 
that Satan, it does say here, that Satan has been rendered useless. He has been rendered useless. Useless how? Once again, he does not retain the power that he once had. More, uh, most, uh, against the child of God. He still, he still does many things that we're going to get into that will still affect the lives of the saved and unsaved alike. But the unsaved, of course, are not under the cover of the blood. And he has more of a free rule and reign in the life of a non-believer than he does with a believer. Amen? And so Satan has been destroyed, rendered useless, uh, to be entirely idle. Okay? He has been brought to naught. He has been made void. That's another meaning of this word destroy. He has been made void. It's nothing that he can do to us. It's really nothing he can do to us. Okay? Uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Okay? Understand. Okay? So, so we have to always keep in mind that Satan is able to do many of the things that he does. Because of one thing. He is a deceiver. He is a deceiver. And because of his, uh, because he is able uh, to deceive, he is able to get away with much of the trickery that he does bring forth, even in the lives of unbelievers. I mean, even in the lives of believers. He does this in many different ways. He twists scripture. Uh, he lies. We, we, we read we read about doctrines of devils, teachings of devils. They have teachings that are opposed to Scripture, okay? Teachings that go directly against Scripture. Okay, once again, that's that's why discernment is so very important, uh, to keep yourself from being deceived by the devil, who will take Scripture and turn it and twist it and have you believing one thing when the opposite is true. Okay? So that's why we must be mindful. Once again, a defeated devil is a dangerous devil. He is dangerous for many, many reasons. So we go on and we read in Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2 uh, and verse number 15. I love this scripture so much. I've given so much time to this particular scripture, uh, but we're going to give some more time to it here. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 15, here's what it says. Well, let me start in verse number 14 because it's that good. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. This is what happened at the cross, on the cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, talking about the law, which was contrary to us, talking about the law, and took it out of the way, talking about the law. Nailing it to his cross. Talking about the law. Verse number 15. And having spoiled. Having spoiled. Principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them. In it. Now this is one of the most. Powerful verses. Once again all the verses are powerful. But this is one of the most powerful verses. That speak to the victory that we have. Through Christ. The victory that we have because of, by the cross. Talking about, we are, we are, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Them. Who? Who's them? Principalities and powers. Who are principalities and powers? The same, the, 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 the same ones that are referred to in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. The whole host of demons. Jesus Christ was victorious over them, triumphing over them in it. And having done that, the Bible says he spoiled these principalities and powers. Spoiled them. That word spoiled, that word spoil, simply put, means to to be disarmed, to be disarmed. The weaponry, the powers, the things, the methods, the the things that Satan does or who he that he would do, has been.
taken away. Has been taken away. He has been disarmed. He cannot do that which he would desire to do. Okay? Because Satan, Satan is, if we go to, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay. Because Satan, excuse me, because Satan is in Romans chapter number 16 and, and verse number 20, it states says that the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. The God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. Now notice what it says. It says God will do it. God will do it. And the only way that God will do it, we, we have to have our faith in Christ. Okay? This is what enables the Spirit of God. It enables the power of God to work on our behalf optimally as our faith is in Christ. And so that, uh, where Satan belongs, is under our feet. He is subdued because Christ triumphed over him, was victorious over him at the cross. And that victory yet remains intact. It has not, that judgment has not been overturned. We, Christ was victorious and we remain victorious because of his victory. Okay, that's important uh, to remember. When Satan comes knocking, and Satan will come knocking, Satan will come knocking to you, knocking at your door with lies, uh, with deceit, with temptation. He will come with all of his, quote, guns. But remember, the bullets have been taken out. The bullets have been taken out. The fiery darts of the devil are extinguished by the shield of faith. Faith. Faith in Christ and his finished work. The fiery darts of the wicked are extinguished. They can have no power over us as we look to Jesus and trust in him. This does not mean, this does not mean that he is not going to come back. He is going to come back. He is going to attack. Uh, he is going to pick his places. He is going to do what he can and do what he will when he is able and when he is allowed. Because this is a, I don't know if you ever played the game as a child, The mother. this is a mother may I. This is a mother may I type of situation. Okay? Satan has to get permission. He has to get permission. So he is not operating from personal power. He is operating on permission. Permission. God, may I. And Satan can say yes. Or, or God rather can say yes. Or God can say no. He has to come before the Lord and ask permission to do what he will. Or, or God will use Satan. Okay? God is an, Satan rather, Satan is uh, an unwitting, I, I, this is one author I'm reading, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from one particular author that I read recently that made the statement, and I agree with it or else I would not use it, that Satan is an unwitting servant in our sanctification. Satan is an unwitting servant in our sanctification, which means that God uses him. God will use him. God will take that temptation. He will take the attack of the enemy. Uh, he will take whatever it is that Satan would want to do and use it as a means to help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. We have to understand that growth does not happen because everything remains static. Growth in the Christian life does not happen because everything is good and well and fine and peachy needle and everything is just cool and everything is just just copacetic. Okay? There's no growth. There can be no growth. Into each life a little rain must fall. No pain, no gain. And so God will use the enemy's whatever and turn it around for our good. Remember Romans 8 and 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's who we are. And even in the bad times, even in the difficult seasons, in the end, in the end, if you remain true to the Lord, you will rejoice in the end. 
you will praise God in the end. And this, once again, will be a means of growth in your life. You will grow. Okay? Because the fact is, the fact is, the question remains, can you and I grow in the dark? Can you and I grow in the dark? When I'm talking about growing in the dark, I'm talking about in difficult seasons. When it's hard. When there is no doubt about it that this is hard. And I don't know why this is happening. And this is just so so really bad that's going on in my life right now and i don't know why can you still grow in the dark and difficult seasons and the answer is yes god will even use that and turn it around for your good that's what god will do and so we need to keep in mind that satan is satan is that unwitting servant of our sanctification. I love that. He <laughs> he plays a part. All the hard times, the temptations and everything, they all play a part in helping us to grow into the people that God would have us to be. Yes. There is a place for all of that in our in our life. So Satan was disarmed at the cross. But keep that in context because we there's still some things that we need to talk about. Um Genesis chapter number 3. Let's go to Genesis chapter number 3. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, you hear us speak about it many times. It's the great, uh, and this is no extra credit for this. This is not something that you need to know. But it's the great proto-evangelium. And that simply means first gospel. It is the first mention of the coming redeemer. Okay? Uh, it is in prophetic terms. And so many people don't really uh, understand uh, what it is speaking about, but it is speaking about the coming Christ. That's what it is speaking about. And here's what it says. And I will put enmity between thee and the women, the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's go through. Uh, let's go through this verse. Uh, this enmity, this enmity, this, this hostility, uh, this animosity is between Satan and the seed of the woman. Okay? Now, let's define, he says, between thy seed. Now, remember, Satan Satan is here talking to the devil. It is the devil who used the serpent to accomplish what he accomplished here. And that is bring the, under, uh, bring the human uh, race under the domain of sin. This is what, this is what the serpent, a.k.a. Satan, did. But what Jesus is telling him, what Jesus is telling uh, Satan in essence, in essence, this is what Satan, uh, what, Jesus, what God is telling Satan in Genesis 3 and 15. He is saying, you use the woman, you use the woman to bring down the human race, okay? You use the woman to bring down the human race. And so here's what I will do, God is saying. I'm going to use the woman as, a, uh, as an instrument to bring the Redeemer that will save the human race. That's in essence what God is telling Satan. And so when he's talking about uh, thy seed to the Satan, he's talking about all of those, all of those individuals who are under Satan's sway. And that is unfortunately the entire world that does not know Jesus. The entire world that does not know Jesus are under the sway of Satan. Let me go to 1 John chapter number 5. And verse number 19, this is where we read this. chapter uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And the original language, what that says is, the whole world lieth under the sway of the wicked one. That's where the world is. That's where the world finds itself. And because of that, because of that, there is a blindness that exists in the human race to the things of God. There is a blindness that Satan, once again, uh, is, is responsible for. But, so her seed, rather Satan's seed, are all of those who don't know the Lord. He goes on in this verse. God goes on in this verse. Between thy seed and her seed. Her seed. Who, who is the woman's seed? Her. Eve. The woman. Who is her seed? 
That would be the Redeemer that we spoke of just a moment ago. That would be Christ and all of those who would follow him. That's the seed of the woman. Specifically Christ. But because we are in Christ, it also is speaking about us. Okay? And that's her seed. It says it, talking about talking about uh, the woman. It shall bruise thy head. The Redeemer that would come from the woman would bruise Satan's head. Now that word bruise, that word bruise here, uh, when we look at it, uh, this word bruise is a word uh, is a word that means uh, to be um, to be crushed. To be crushed. Uh, we read that we, we read a, a, a similar word uh, in Romans chapter sixteen and verse number twenty uh, that it would br it would bruise thy head. Now a bruise to the head, uh, a this blow to the head is a death blow. If you get hit upside the head hard enough, it's not going to be a concussion. Okay, if you get hit upside the head hard enough with the right with the right thing, that's a death blow. That will kill you. And that is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus' death on the cross would be a death blow. It would bruise Satan's head. Okay, it would bruise his head. It would bring him all of the, when we talk about this death blow, we're talking about the, 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 the his power that we've been talking about. His power would be taken away. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse number 15 This is all what transpired at the cross He goes on in verse number 15 It shall bruise thy head And thou, you devil You Satan Shall bruise his heel His, who's his? The redeemer that would come from the woman You will bruise his heel Now what, what does that mean? He would receive a death blow to the head Now this same word is used the same word is used here, the same word bruise, but it, it's talking about the heel, the heel, the foot, the ankle. Okay, you know, you know that uh, you, you you if your foot, if your ankle gets injured or your foot get injured, it, that'll be a limp. What he's talking about, what he's talking about here is that the damage to Jesus physically would be minimal. Because we know the truth that Christ would rise again. That his death would not be the end. He would come back again. And so this bruise on Jesus' heel would not be something that would keep him away. Yet the bruise on Satan's head would take his power away. And render him, as we said earlier, useless. Void. At least as far as it goes to the child of God. That's why it's important that we know Jesus. That's why that's why the Lord tells us to go out and preach the gospel. So that those who don't know will know. That they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they also will be no longer under the sway of Satan. And Satan will no longer have dominion over them. That's why we need to get the word out. And so Genesis 3.15, uh, Genesis 3.15 is a powerful verse that also speaks to the fact that Satan is a defeated foe. All throughout the Old Testament, Satan has been going, about, he went about trying to find this Redeemer. Who is this Redeemer? Who is this one that is going to crush my head? It wasn't Abraham, it wasn't Isaac, it wasn't Jacob, it wasn't Job. It wasn't David. It, it wasn't any of the prophets. Satan tried to destroy all of these men in one way or another. But they were not the one. They were not the chosen one. And we would not find, he would not be able to quote find uh, the Redeemer until we get to the book of Matthew where Herod goes about uh, under the, un, once again I believe, uh, under the control of Satan literally he goes out and 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 kills uh, those children searching for the baby Jesus, and he did eventually quote find him, but he still was not able to put him away. He thought he had put him away. He thought he wanted him dead. Uh, the devil thought 
that death would be what was necessary to, to, to ensure his own victory. But he did not take into account that, his, that, that death was just what was needed. So once again, we see Satan being the unwitting. Uh, he, he played a part in this. He wanted to get Jesus dead, and Jesus became dead, but he also became alive. Okay, so we have to be be very very uh, mindful. Be be very very mindful of this question. Could the bruise on Jesus' heel be seen as a temporary bruise, or he would come back from where Satan's bruise would be fatal? The bruise on Jesus' heel uh, was temporary. Uh, if you want to, the Bible calls it a bruise. Here, uh, it, it was. It was temporary, okay. We 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 read uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter fifty-three. He was wounded for our transgressions; he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we know that there was there was physically speaking, there was a bruising that did take place on the body in the life of Jesus, physically speaking. But spiritually speaking, he took the whole world upon his shoulders, the sins rather, of the whole world upon his shoulders. Okay, that, that is important to remember. He took the, the sins of the world upon himself. But to do that, he had to endure literal, physical suffering. But it was for a purpose. And in the end, once again, he would come back. He would come back. He told Thomas, look at the... Look at the prints in my hands and my side. It's me. It's me. He still retained he still retained the marks on his body, but he was alive. Death could not hold him down. We just read in Hebrews chapter two and verse number fourteen that Satan had the power of death. But the Bible says in Revelation that Jesus has the keys of hell and of death. He reclaimed all of that. At the cross, he reclaimed all of that at the cross, and that's important. Uh, for once again, important for us uh, to uh, remember. When we go to the book of Mark, the book of Mark, Mark chapter number three, and verse number twenty-seven, we're talking about uh, we're talking about how the devil is defeated, the many ways in which the devil is defeated. By review, we said that Satan has been cast out. Number one. Number two, we said that Satan has been judged. Amen. Number three, we said Satan, his works have been destroyed. Number four, we said that Satan himself has been destroyed. Now, once again, we're going to give context to that. Uh, we said also that Satan, his, that he has been disarmed. Not just him, but his whole host of, of demons. Uh, that he has been bruised. He has been bruised. Finally, we come to Mark chapter number 3 and verse number 27, which says, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil the house. He will bind the strong man, and then he will spoil the house. And so what this seems to say, was, what it does say is that before there can be a spoiling, there needs to be a binding. Before there can be a spoiling, there needs to be a binding. And so Jesus bound Satan at the cross. He was bound. And once Satan was bound, that's when he was spoiled. There was nothing, in other words... There was nothing, he was rendered powerless. There was nothing that the devil could do about what Jesus did. All right? There was nothing that the devil could do about what Jesus did. Or, let's put it in this context, there was nothing that the devil could do about what Jesus was doing. He couldn't stop it. Because why? Because he was bound. He was bound. And that simply means that he was... Uh, that he was tied up, spiritually speaking. You know, we, I don't want to put that in a physical say, in a p physical sense. But he, he at least spiritually speaking, he was held. He was he was bound. He was bound. He could do nothing about what Jesus was doing. 
Uh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Now, when we take all this into account, we've said that Satan has no power. Uh, we said that we, we said that his works have been destroyed. We said that he has been destroyed. Uh, we says that he. We say that he has been disarmed, bruised, bound. If all of that is true, then why do we have so much turmoil in the world? Because as we said, Satan still retains a modicum, a measure. Of power, and once again, that is no contradiction of terms. He's powerless, but he has power. Yes, he has power. He needs to have a a, a measure of power in order that he remains the servant of our sanctification. There are certain things that Satan does and will do. Let me put it another way that sounds very offensive to some. There are certain things that Satan must do. There are certain things that God will allow Satan to do. That he will have. He is able to uh, usurp that power over the unsaved as much as he can. Okay? They have no idea what is happening. They have no idea what is happening to them. They are they are uh, unwilling or willing participants in what Satan is doing. Once again, because they are under Satan's sway. Being under Satan's sway does not mean that you are possessed by him. It just means that you are a part of the world system and you are part of what makes this world system go round. Okay? I'm talking about the entertainment. I'm talking about the fashion. I'm talking about uh, what this world does and what it is. It's all a, a product of what Satan has made happen. Good being called evil. Evil being called good. All of these things are part of what the devil has set up and what he has done. I was about to say created, but Satan doesn't really create. He doesn't have the power to create. He has the power to uh, to spoil. Uh, he has the power to to place some, to make something that is good and, and turn it and twist it around. But he Satan cannot create something from nothing. Okay, that's what God does. So Satan. So Satan yet has power, okay? He is a dangerous adversary. He is a dangerous adversary, okay? Um, when we come together next week, when we come together next week, we're going to talk about uh, some of these things that the enemy still yet is able to do because of this measure of power that he is allowed to have. And I have to put it in that way, that he is allowed to have. Once again, you, you've heard you've heard us say it time and time again, and I'm going to say it again. Satan is not a free agent. He is not a free agent. He does not go about and cause havoc because he can. Because I'm the devil, and I'm doing it because I'm the devil, and I'm doing it. No, he 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 wants you to have that impression. He wants you to see, once again, he is a deceiver. He wants you to believe that he is in control. He wants you to believe that he is the, the keeper and maker of all things evil. Okay? And that is true in a sense how I put it. But he wants you to believe that it all, that the buck stops and starts with him. That he is in control. But he is not. He is on a leash. And that game, Mother May I, comes into play. Just go back to the book of Job, chapter number 1, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Job chapter number 2, rather. Go back and see, and, you, and you'll see what I mean. We'll talk about that next time we come together. Amen? Right now, I just want you to keep in mind, I just want you to keep in mind that one of the things that the cross does for us, the cross lets us know in no uncertain terms, if you've, have, if you've understood nothing that we've said tonight, the cross tells us in no uncertain terms, to put it bluntly, the devil is defeated. He's beat. He's done. He's done. He is a defeated foe. Next time we come together, we'll talk about the fact that that means that he's dangerous. And we'll talk about some of the dangerous things that he yet does and tries to do. Amen. Lord, we bless you tonight. We thank you once again. You've given us this opportunity to once again open up your word. Lord, we are so gracious. Even when we speak about 
Uh, even when we speak about the enemy, Lord, we know that we must be very careful. We don't want to give the impression to, to those uh, under the sound of your word. We don't want to give the impression that Satan has has this great uh, control uh, over, uh, over us because he does not. But the Bible does say that we are not ignorant of his device, indicating that we should not be ignorant of what the devil can do. We know that we come from a place of victory and we are not worried about what the devil can do, but we do know that he can accomplish some things because of this limited power that he has. So once as we know that as, as long as we keep our eyes on you and our faith in you, Satan does not have the grip on us that he would like to have. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. Amen. We thank the Lord once again for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, here tonight. Uh, thank you for being with us once again. Uh, we pray that your time, uh, we pray that your time spent uh, in God's word has been a has been a fruitful one. God bless you, Bobby Joe and, and Keisha, Frank, Doris. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Don't forget, once again, if you're watching over Facebook, uh, don't forget to share this page out that others also may be blessed. Amen. Let me go ahead and invite you to join us uh, for our upcoming for our upcoming. Uh, podcast. Uh, we'll be here, God willing, we'll be here on uh, Monday night. We'll be here on Monday night, uh, rather Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, rather at 4 p.m., continuing our series entitled Now Walk with God. We're exploring the elements and benefits of the best thing on earth, and that is walking with God. Uh, once again, that'll be 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Monday night, Monday night, we'll be in 2 Corinthians Chapter number five in the Line by Line podcast. Join us for this verse by verse study. Um, we're being blessed. I, I know I'm being blessed, and I pray that you'll join us so that you can share in uh, what we are uh, share in in God's word as we read it together. Amen. Verse by verse. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. We're going to continue. We're going to continue with part two of Revival 101. Amen. Uh, some more things. <laughs> some more things that we all need to know. And remember, that'll be uh, Tuesday night, uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And once again, we'll be back here uh, next week uh, with part two of The Defeated Devil. Amen. So once again, we just bless the Lord and we thank him for what he is doing in our midst. If you need to know more about who we are with That's The Word Ministries, you can go to our website at thatstheword.org. If you need more information, uh, if you'd like to give to this ministry, you can also do that here. You can also go to our YouTube channel and become a subscriber if you have not done so already. You can also go over to Spreaker.com uh, and listen to all of these podcasts um, on your smart device or your computer. Uh, amen. And you, while you're there, you can see the other podcasts that the Lord has enabled us to produce over the years. Amen. So shout out to those of you who do listen in on Spreaker.com from across the United States and even around the world. We see you in Italy, Australia, uh, India, uh, and other parts of the world. We see you and we thank you for joining us. Amen. We thank you for listening live and for downloading uh, these lessons. Amen. So we just bless the Lord. We thank, him for, we thank you for joining us. And we're going to see you next time. We'll be back here, as I said, Sunday afternoon, 4 o'clock p.m. live. I hope you can join us. If not, uh, you can always catch us on the replay. Amen. I am Michael Jakes. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you next time. Have a good night. And God bless you.